Today we're going over five reasons why the pressure on the blue gauge, which is connected to the large vapor line, is too low. If the pressure is too low, then that also means that the saturated temperature is too low. The blue gauge correlates to the pressure and temperature in the middle of the indoor evaporator coil, and if that saturated temperature is below 32 degrees, any humidity in the air crossing that indoor evaporator coil is going to freeze onto that coil, and that's a problem. So we're going to identify some of the reasons why that may be occurring and why that vapor pressure will not be increasing even if refrigerant was added to the system. We're going to give you indicators so you know what the actual problem is. In our examples, we're going to be using single speed air conditioning systems with r 4 a refrigerant inside and we're measuring the low side pressure on the blue gauge and the high side pressure on the red gauge. We're also measuring our line temperatures. Our first possible problem could be that you are just low on refrigerant and so if the system is equipped with a piston orifice, we need to check the refrigerant charge with the total superheat method with the blue gauge and the temperature on the large vapor line. We're measuring an r 4 a pressure of 97 PSI. We convert that to the r 4 a saturated temperature in the middle of the indoor coil and it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's below freezing, that's a problem. We're also measuring a line temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and so we take 68 minus 30, and we're left with 38 degrees of total superheat. That is a very high superheat. We need to compare that to whatever the target superheat is on that running system, and so we're gonna determine the target superheat by first measuring the outdoor dry bulb temperature, which in this case, it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The indoor wet bulb temperature, which is measured with a psychrometer, that is 66 degrees, and so you can use a digital psychrometer right over by the return grill in order to measure that indoor wet bulb temperature. Using a target superheat chart or a calculation, we find that we have a 13 degree target superheat. So we compare our target superheat of 13 degrees to our actual running total superheat of 38 degrees, and we have 25 degrees too high of an actual superheat. So that's an indication that we're low on refrigerant, but we also need to check over on our red gauge. And so on the red gauge, we have a pressure of 309.5 PSI. We convert that to a R4 to nice saturated temperature of 98 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature it is in the middle of the outdoor coil. On the liquid line, we're measuring a temperature as well of 98 degrees. So 98 minus 98, we have zero degrees of subcooling. So subcooling is the temperature decrease of the liquid refrigerant from the middle of the outdoor coil until the refrigerant exits on the small liquid line. Since we have a very low subcooling and because we have a very high superheat, that means that we are low on refrigerant. And if you have a thermostatic expansion valve, you can primarily just check the refrigerant charge using the subcooling method. If you have a piston orifice, you can check it with just the total superheat method. So the long and short of this is it's not just about pressures. We need to be able to convert those to saturated temperatures and also take line temps in order to determine what the problem is. And you're gonna see this as we move forward. It doesn't always mean you're low on refrigerant. You can't just go by the blue gauge with a low pressure and a low saturated temperature and think that you're low on refrigerant. It doesn't work that way. And we're gonna give you the indicators so that you're able to determine what's going on as we move forward. If you're very low on refrigerant, you're gonna have to search for that leak in order to fix the leak before adding refrigerant back into the system. Again, otherwise it's gonna leak out to the environment, which is very bad for the environment. And also as a technician, you're probably gonna end up there again the next day adding more refrigerant in and that's not gonna be a good scenario. You have to find and fix a leak. The second possible problem is that the indoor heat load is too low. And what that means is that the temperature inside the building is too low in order to check the refrigerant charge accurately uh, as well. Maybe the humidity is down too low. So you have to only check the refrigerant charge if you're 70 degrees Fahrenheit or above inside and also 70 degrees Fahrenheit or above outside. If you're below that, your blue gauge pressure and saturated temperature are gonna to be too low. So if it's 60 degrees inside, your low side pressure, in this scenario, it's 97 PSI converted to a saturated temperature, it's still below freezing. It's 30 degrees as your saturated temperature. So if this system has a piston as the metering device and we have a line temperature of 32 degrees, we take our line temperature minus our saturated temperature in order to determine our total superheat. So 32 degrees Fahrenheit minus 30, and we're left with two degrees of total superheat. So superheat is a temperature increase of the vapor refrigerant in the indoor coil. 
total superheat is measured at the outdoor large vapor line port and it's the temperature increase of the vapor refrigerant between the indoor coil and where the refrigerant travels through the large vapor tube toward the outdoor unit's compressor. So if you have a very low superheat, you would think, well, I must be overcharged because I have a very, very small superheat, two degrees, that's, that's really low. In this case, you need to also look at the red high side gauge. And so in this instance, we have a pressure of 336 PSI. We convert that to a saturated temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 104 degrees is our saturated temperature, and we have a liquid line temperature of 94. So to determine our subcooling, we take the saturated temperature minus the line temperature. So it's the opposite of superheat, where superheat, what you're measuring is the line temperature minus the saturated temperature. So anyway, subcooling. 104 degrees as your saturated temperature minus 94 degrees and we're left with 10 degrees of subcooling. If we have that much subcooling, like that's a pretty average number right there of 10. So typically we're right around eight to say 14 or 16 degrees of subcooling. To have 10 degrees of subcooling, we're not overcharged. We don't have a very high subcooling. So that means we have another issue happening. So if we have a fixed orifice, a piston, as the metering device at the indoor coil, we have low superheat and we have normal subcooling, then that means we have a low indoor heat load. So in this instance, it's 60 degrees inside, it's just too low in order to check the refrigerant charge. In this instance, you would not just add refrigerant to the system because what's gonna happen is your superheat is gonna lower even more. If you have no superheat, so you get down to like one degree of total superheat and then zero degrees of total superheat, and then you're, maybe your subcooling increases from 10 to maybe 11 or 12, that's gonna be a big problem for your vapor compressor because if you have zero degrees of total superheat, you're gonna have liquid refrigerant or saturated refrigerant heading right into your vapor compressor and it's gonna damage it. So you would not do that. You just wanna diagnose the issue and you just wanna be aware. Don't be checking the refrigerant charge when it's really low temperature inside the building. Now we're still in our possible problem number two with the low indoor temperature inside the building of 60 degrees. But in this case, we're looking at a system that is equipped with a thermostatic expansion valve at the indoor coil. In this instance, we really wanna pay more attention to the red gauge and the subcooling method. So in this instance, we have 336 PSI we convert that to a saturated temperature of 104, and we have a line temperature of 94 degrees on that liquid line. So we take our sat temp minus our line temp, so 104 degrees minus 94 degrees, and we're left with a subcooling of 10 degrees. We already know that we have an accurate refrigerant charge because we're at 10 degrees of subcooling. Now let's look at the blue gauge. The blue gauge is still too low in pressure, right? It's at 97 PSI converted to a saturated temperature, it's 30 degrees. So that's still below 32 degrees. And so it's gonna freeze any humidity in the air crossing that indoor coil. It's a problem still, right? Now let's look at the vapor line temperature. So we have 38 degrees as our vapor line temperature minus 30 degree saturated temperature to determine our total superheat. So we take 38 minus 30 and we're left with eight degrees of total superheat. Eight degrees of total superheat and 10 degrees of subcooling, that sounds to me like it's an accurate refrigerant charge. The problem is our pressure and saturated temperature on our low side blue gauge are too low. That is a pure indication that there is a very low heat load inside the building. You are not giving the refrigerant in the indoor coil enough heat to absorb to have it be at a higher pressure and higher saturated temperature. That's the issue. So in this instance, once again, you would not add refrigerant to the system in order to try to increase the vapor gauge pressure. And in fact, all that's gonna happen is with a TXV, you are not gonna be increasing the pressure on the, on the blue gauge. You're only gonna be increasing the pressure on the red gauge if you try to do that. And your sub queen is gonna increase and your red high side gauge pressure is gonna increase. You're gonna be paying more for electricity in order to run the unit and you're gonna still have the same readings over on the blue low side gauge. So just use these indicators in order to determine the problem. So on a system with a TXV, a thermostatic expansion valve, if you have the correct subcoin, you have the correct superheat, and your vapor line saturated temperature is too low, you know that you have a low indoor heat load. And which brings us to our third possible problem. Our third possible problem is we really shouldn't even have the gauges attached in this scenario because you really need to measure airflow, the amount of cubic feet per minute that's crossing that indoor coil before you even attach the gauges. 
So the possible problem for number three is low indoor airflow, which is going to give you the same readings as a low indoor air temperature. So some of the issues could be that you have a blocked air filter, so it's clogged. You could have undersized ductwork. You could have that the bottom of the indoor coil is clogged with dust, and that would be due to maybe somebody not having a filter in there or the, the filter not catching enough dust. So all those issues can result in low indoor airflow, which means that your saturated temperature on your blue low side gauge is going to be too low. So this is a reminder to check the indoor airflow before measuring the refrigerant charge because you want to have around 400 cubic feet per minute per 12,000 BTUs of outdoor unit capacity. I'll have several videos for checking the indoor airflow linked down in the description section below. Our fourth possible problem, and this is a question I get asked a lot, and it's why is the blue low side pressure not rising as I'm adding refrigerant into the system? So if a technician's doing a startup on a system and they're checking their superheat and their subcoiling at their, their gauges and they're taking their temperature measurements on their vapor and liquid line and they notice as they add refrigerant, maybe over a period of say 15 minutes or maybe 20 minutes, they've added maybe six ounces or maybe 10 ounces of refrigerant upon the initial startup because maybe the system needed the extra refrigerant, right? But in their mind, they're, they're trying to shoot for a certain saturated temperature on that blue low side gauge. And that a lot of times is not going to happen. So I'm gonna explain why. On the blue gauge, we have a pressure of 105 PSI and we convert that to the saturated temperature of R4 tonight and that is 34 degrees. On the large vapor line, we're measuring a temperature of 46 degrees. To find the total superheat, we take 46 degree line temp minus our 34 degree sat temp and we have 12 degrees of total superheat. And that's a good superheat. And on the red gauge, we have a pressure of 365.8 PSI. We convert that to a saturated temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we also have a liquid line temperature of 104 degrees. So we take 110 minus 104 and we're left with six degrees of subcooling. If this system had a thermostatic expansion valve, and we have six degrees of subcooling, we're probably a little low. Of course, you're gonna to have to check on the outdoor unit rating plate to see what the target subcooling is. If the outdoor unit rating plate posted a target subcooling of 11 degrees and you have six degrees actually on the system, then your subcooling is too low and you're low on refrigerant. So knowing this, if you're adding refrigerant, say you started adding re the refrigerant when it was just 70 degrees inside the building, and you're adding refrigerant, you're adding refrigerant, right? Because this is an initial startup and the refrigerant's needed for the system to operate correctly. And now you're at this point where now on the red gauge and you're measuring a pressure of 376.2 PSI, we convert that to a saturated temperature of 112 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the saturated temperature in the middle of the outdoor coil. And the temperature on that small liquid line is 103 degrees. We take 112 minus 103 and we're left with a subcooling of nine degrees. So you see the subcoin has increased and, and we are within range of having the correct refrigerant charge. Because if the target was 11 and we're at nine, then we're within plus or minus three degrees of the target subcoin. Of course, we could add just a little bit more refrigerant. But if you notice on the blue gauge, we still have 105 PSI. And we convert that to the saturated temperature for R4 tonight and it's 34 degrees. We also still have 46 degrees on our vapor line. So to find the total superheat, we take 46 degrees minus 34 degrees, and we're still left with 12 degrees of total superheat. So what happened? Well, as the system's been running and as you've been adding refrigerant into the system, the indoor temperature has lowered, the humidity has lowered. So the entire wet bulb temperature, the entire heat load inside the building has lowered to a point where it's really a little too low in order to check the refrigerant charge. So maybe even though you started at 70 degrees inside, maybe you're all the way down at say 63 degrees inside the building. So no wonder you have a low pressure on the blue gauge and a low saturated temperature on that blue gauge. But in this instance, if you did measure airflow and you do have the correct amount of airflow on the system and you do have the correct amount of subcoin and you know your TXV is working properly because you do have 12 degrees of total superheat, then you know that the system is operating correctly and you just have that low indoor air temperature at this point in time. So that system is checked and good 
as long as you do know that you have good airflow crossing that indoor coil. Possible problem number five is if you have what's called a liquid line restriction. And that means it's a clog in the liquid line before the metering device or in the metering device that's not allowing enough refrigerant into the indoor coil even when you have an accurate refrigerant charge. So let's look over at the high side gauge first. We have 356.5 PSI. We convert that to the saturated temperature of R4 tonight in the middle of the outdoor coil. We have 108 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature on the small liquid line is 92 degrees. So we take 108 minus 92 and we're left with a subcooling of 16 degrees. So think about what we know about subcooling. It's usually around 11 degrees. On the high side, you might have a target subcooling posted on an outdoor unit rating plate of like 14 degrees. In this instance, though, we're measuring a little bit high of a subcooling. Now let's look over on the blue gauge and we're measuring a pressure of 93 PSI. We convert that to the R4 tonight, saturated temperature in the middle of the indoor coil and we're left with 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And to find the total superheat, we take 72 degrees minus 28 degrees, and we're left with 44 degrees of total superheat. So our subcoin is normal to high, and our total superheat is very high. If our superheat is very, very high, that means that we have more of a heat load crossing that indoor coil than refrigerant to absorb that heat, which means that you have not enough refrigerant in that indoor coil to absorb the heat load crossing the coil. So that does not mean that you are undercharged because what's going to happen in this scenario is if you add refrigerant, all that's going to happen is your red high side gauge pressure is going to increase. Then your, your liquid line temperature, that may start to decrease. So you're going to have a spread. You're going to have more and more subcooling, which is going to make you less electrically efficient to run, and it still may not raise that blue gauge pressure and saturated temperature higher because you have a clog somewhere in that liquid line. That could be a strainer screen right before the metering device. That could be maybe a TXV with a, a bulb that has leaked its refrigerant out. That could be a clogged filter dryer. It could be a number of things, but you would not be adding refrigerant into the system to diagnose the problem here. You just use your pressures converted to saturated temperatures for your blue gauge and your red gauge. Then you use your subcoin and your superheat, and then you just use those indicators to determine the problem. We don't want to go around wasting refrigerant, trying to put that into the system and guessing, trying to figure out what the problem is. We want to use proper diagnosis techniques. And if you want to learn more, we wrote a whole book about this, our refrigerant charging and service procedures for air conditioning about checking the charge and diagnosing problems, say in real time, by taking those saturated temperature, superheat, and subcoin measurements, we have an indicator chart right here in our quick reference cards. So these are polystyrene cards that you can keep in your service truck or in your service bag, and it gives you multiple indicators in order to determine what the problem actually is. For our book, we have a thousand question workbook that you can use in order to do like a self-study for the book in order to determine if you are really understanding the concepts. So make sure to check all three of these products out over at our website at aecservicetech.com and also on Amazon. And also make sure to check out our new book on inverter mini splits, which is the Inverter Mini Split Operation and Service Procedures book. This book is also available over at our website at aecservicetech.com and over on Amazon. We also have our eBooks available over at Google Play and Apple Books. Just look up AC Service Tech book for more info. And we also have links to all this in the description section below. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech channel.